Okay. I'm Leanne Johnston, and I'm the coordinator for Youth and Young Adult Ministries for the Central Texas Conference. And um, my, personally, my biggest struggle, not professionally, not the question I get the most in my position, but personally, my biggest struggle is um, dealing with those, um, Kylan calls them people who require uh, tender care. Um, how do you... How do you have a group of young adults that includes people who uh, who have kind of a lot of needs, uh, be that physical, social, um, what have you, especially when they're not really aware of those needs? Um, how do you assimilate them into the group? Um, so I expect you all to have the answer to that question. Somebody else jump in there and introduce yourself. I'm Marianne Brown. I'm a student at Southwestern in Georgetown, and I work at St. Phillips United Methodist in Round Rock. And um, I have a lot of problems in young adult ministry, almost all of the problems I think I have them. But um, one of the ones I'm thinking about recently is kind of the transitions back and forth between home church and school church and how the ministries in each of those are different for you depending on if it's your school church or your home church. Mm. Excellent. All right, so I guess I'll go next. <laughs> so, hey, what what age group are we talking about as young adults? Uh, Eighteen to thirty-five. Oh, okay, that's what I thought. So. Um, so I'm Josh Worthen. I'm the co-director of student ministries at Saginaw Young Methodist Church. Um, currently don't have um, a young adult program. That's probably kind of the biggest struggle is seeing um, the students kind of leave from the youth group and not having much for them here. Um, so I was kind of wanting to join to kind of hear what um, others that have things going had to say. Excellent. Kristen, you haven't missed a thing. We are just introducing ourselves. Um, I am Abby Parker from the, I guess Austin is where I'm from, but I work with Young People's Ministries uh, part-time as the representative uh, for youth and young people in our jurisdiction. And um, so I get to communicate with a lot of different youth and young people. Um, I also do a new church start here in Austin, Texas called Servant Church, and it is for young people primarily that's our mission field and what I struggle most with is dealing with the fact that um, those communities are just really transient and um, I guess what I'm wondering about right now is how do we get more people involved in our in committing to anything in general but just getting them to commit to doing service together, to doing life together. Um, sometimes they're really good at that, and sometimes, and now I'll speak it as a young adult, we're not good at that at all. So, Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Abby. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> all right, Kristen, you want to introduce yourself? Can she? I feel like she maybe can't hear us. I don't know. Oh, she, I just heard, saw her mouth. I can hear you. We can't mm -mm. hear you, Kristen. Oh, she has no sound. Okay. Um, Kristen is a prettier half of Josh. Definitely. But I do have longer hair than her now. But she is such a chunk hair. Okay, go ahead, Kristen. Introduce yourself. She's like underwater. <laughs> okay, we can hear you. You sound like you are under water. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let's give Kristen a minute to figure it out, otherwise I'm going to mute her because um, 
<laughs> That's okay. Um, and she can't hear us either. Well, Kristen, I'm going to mute you, and if if you uh, decide that you don't want to be muted anymore, <laughs> it just makes me feel really bad muting people. You can you still hear me now? No, I can't. We cannot hear you. No. Okay, we're going to jump in. Um, excellent. Well, let's um. I got some questions in, but actually the questions that I got in weren't from any of y'all except Abby. Um, so I think, you know, if you don't participate, then we won't get your questions answered. No, just kidding. If we, uh, if we get to it, then we'll answer, um, we'll answer all the questions that I got. Sorry, I'm distracted by Kristen. She's, I feel really bad muting her. She's typing. This, I find... Google Hangouts to be really awesome and incredibly distracting at the same time. Oh, she got it. So let me, you muted, you muted. How do I unmute? I can hear you. Okay, Kristen, say something. I don't think you're muted anymore. Oh, maybe you are. Let me see. Try something now. No. On my side. Oh, there we go. Better? Yes. Yay. Yay. Success. Okay, Kristen, would you like to share your biggest struggle in young adult ministry? Oh, I've got to think for a minute. Can you <laughs> I'm sorry, no thinking. <laughs> go, go, go. No thinking? No. Um, I just did oh, Josh's biggest struggle? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear his, so I actually don't know what I'm dittoing. <laughs> He said that there wasn't a young adult program, so youth kind of graduate, and that's it. That is um, a big, big struggle, yes. And keeping track of them without any kind of a young adult program to help keep track of them becomes a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, that coupled with Abby's transient thing really makes. Um, let me see how do I unpick you? really makes that young adult ministry, I think, really challenging. Um, oh, Josh, your background changed. Now it's, this is very distracting. Okay. So how do we start a young adult program? Let's talk there, and then we can address the transient issue, and we can probably address some of Marianne's um, questions as well. Um, Let's just jump in. How do we start a young adult program? Did we just lose Josh? Now he's gone. So how do we start a young adult program? <laughs> Does anybody have great ideas? Um, I mean, I have started one. So I can <laughs> jump in. <laughs> but um, essentially, I mean, you have to start meeting with at least one or two young people. Um, I always say start with healthy young people. I think a lot of times people start groups with the least healthy folks and then the group is quickly overwhelmed by all the problems that that person is bringing and um, that's just not good for anyone. Mm -hmm. So you want to find a healthy person to uh, start meeting with you and the way we started Servant Church was we just started dreaming with a couple of people in a living room about what what would make church a place we'd want to invite our friends to and we started meeting on Monday nights and that just grew and grew and grew until we were able to worship together on Sundays. Um, I know not everyone is trying to start a worship service but I mean, to me, step one is finding a couple of healthy young people and dreaming together. I love that, Abby. Thank you for jumping in. Um, that's usually what I tell. I pastors often ask me, "How do you start a young adult group?" And um, I tell them very similar to what Abby said. And um, people who are more concrete thinkers don't really like the organicness of that. The, um, well, you find people who are committed to something, that are healthy, that are 
in your church somewhere. Because often when we're starting a, a young adult program, and, and maybe the Warthens can jump in on this, that their experience in Saginaw, there are, the people are there. They're just not, they don't know each other, or, and, and I don't mean that there are like 50 people, but maybe there's five or six young adults in your community already that are already um, involved in some capacity. Either they attend Sunday Sunday school, or they attend worship on Sunday morning, or they've been on a mission trip, or you know somehow connected to the church, but they don't know each other. So, you know, meeting at a coffee house with two or three people to kind of vision and plan and think and and then build upon that um, that seems to be the most healthy way to start something, in my experience. Um, what do y'all? Warthens, Marianne, do you have thoughts on that? I think you're I think you're right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Make sure I didn't mute myself. Um, I think you're right. I think finding that, that small group, um, beyond that what we found, um, we met with our young adults a few times and then they kind of fell away, right? Um, so there was that sense of um, creating some, some ownership in that group for them. Mm -hmm. that, that maybe needed to be there, and maybe that sense of a purpose, not just for, um, not just for gathering for gathering's sake, but but where are we heading? What are we doing? Um, you know, who are we as young adults in the church? So um, there's that, and then I think in and I don't know exactly what Abby said about having the the transient students, but. Um, for those students who come in and come out as um, their semesters wax and wane, um, mm -hmm. you know, creating those purposeful moments of, of worship and of service when they're there. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it all kind of, I feel like, starts with um, getting those few students and then identifying now what is our purpose and where are we going and, and what are we meaning for. Mm -hmm. So. Love it. Purpose is awesome. Um, pastors, uh, some of the folks I meet with often get hung up on Sunday school. Like, we need to start a young adult Sunday school. Okay, That's great. And sometimes that's where you need to start. Um, but um, the, the, the words Sunday school aren't all that appealing <laughs> to uh, younger people. And, um, and it's not the best time always for younger people. Um, and that, it, I think there are very few things that run the gamut of 18 to 35, but early Sunday morning is, is, is not the prime time for those people. Um, so finding another time, uh, uh, identifying different needs um, based on what kind of young adult you're looking for. And I, um, you can disagree with me, and that's totally fine. I, I think that it's okay to bring younger and older young adults together to grow and then split. Um, if you have, if that's your demographic, obviously if you're in a college town or something like that where you, your demographic is, is college age folks, it makes sense to start there. Or if you're in a demographic where you have no, nobody under 25, um, but, but I've, I hear often, not from people doing young adult ministry, but from others, that you should not bring the 18-year-olds and the 35-year-olds together. Well, maybe that would be an awkward scenario, having like one 18-year-old and one 35-year-old. But if you have single, married, those with little children, I'm okay hanging out intergenerationally like that. Um, and I think that's, that's fine. We do a young adult um, group here in our home on Thursday nights. And my husband and I are the oldest. Um, but there's a couple of other couples that are pregnant, that have young, a young little one. Uh, we have a son. And then we have some seminary students that are single and some college students that are single. And we all, I think, I think it's great. Um, we're not in the same place in life, but we all like to eat. Uh, we like to play games. We like to spend time together. We like to encourage and support each other. Uh, I think it works out well, and I think if we ever got to the point where we were 20 or 25 people, we would split and have the younger folks go one way, and they would probably stay out much later than I want to. 
and the older folks with kids would, um, you know, party really hard until nine o'clock, and then we would all go to bed separately in our own homes. Um, I, and I think that that works great. What's your experience on like what do you do with with young adults um, given those parameters of eighteen to thirty five? At um, First Georgetown, then the college ministry is kind of led by some of the younger adults they have mm -hmm. in the church. And it's interesting in Georgetown specifically because pretty much anyone in Georgetown, still in Georgetown, not going to school, graduated from Southwestern and just likes Georgetown, so they suck around. And so then it's kind of nice because we have kind of that common experience. Mm -hmm. But um, it's like we get to meet some of them, but it's also like there are other things that they do and there are other things that we do. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't feel like we're being lumped together. So that's kind of cool. Awesome. And then that, the, the young adult group that meets at our home, uh, my husband and I make the meal because we, we can. We have time. We have a kitchen. And uh, it's something we can provide. And I think that's why some of the single younger folks come because we feed them and that's great um, we have stuff that, and then they go off and do their own things sometimes but at, after I'm in bed and asleep um, but I think that's I think that's fantastic Marianne thank you what are some other thoughts on what to do with young adults now we have you know if we have a, a little group what do we do with them we also um, like you said it's it started out of at first Georgetown they felt like they needed a Sunday school class, but we meet Sundays at like one for lunch, and then that's kind of nice because um, like I don't go to church there, but I'm integrated into that community because my friends go to church there and because Brad and Amy are my heroes and I live a block away, and so I can be part of that even though. I don't necessarily go to church there, and there are some people that don't necessarily go to church anywhere, but mm -hmm. they know that that's an opportunity for them, and so they can come to that too. And so I think that considering that is a good thing too. Awesome. And that's a gateway into the church for someone who maybe is uncomfortable with the church. Like, everybody's comfortable eating lunch. Yep. Food is awesome. Good. Awesome. Yeah, I think giving young people a space to dream and think about what their purpose is within the church um, is really important. I realize I come from a really weird spot where since I am a new church, I can pretty much do whatever I want. But what I think when it comes to starting a young adult ministry, um, it's good to let them dream up and provide some ways to cast those visions. Um, but then also I really do think it's the job of anyone that's hired or maybe the lay person in charge mm -hmm. to help push the congregation to allow those dreams to come to fruition and to make sure there's room at the table. Um, I don't work with a ton of college age students. We have a few that were coming to Servant Church off and on um, when they're able. but. Um, I know for older uh, young adults, they really want to feel like there's a purpose to being there and that they're part of the mission of the church. And a lot of times, there's just not really a place at the table that's a real place. And so I think both of those are really important, providing real space to do real things and actually things that might change the culture of your church. Um, and providing space to dream up those things, too. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I think that's crucial. Um, I think, too, giving them a space to serve within the church, right? Mm -hmm. Like, some of our um, strongest young adults um, and college students are the ones who are involved in other ministries, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, the girl who leads the, the kids' choirs that Michaela and Catherine are part of. Um, she's, a, she's a senior at TCU, um, and she's phenomenal, and she's plugged into the church, and she's serving in the church. Um, am I doing something funny? 
<laughs> no, Abby just was. Yeah, I said go home. frogs. Uh huh. Oh, she was doing her thing. Um, <laughs> so I'm a yellow jacket, so I don't notice it if it's not this. <laughs> anyway, um, so giving them that place where they can serve, I feel like is, is pretty vital as well. Um, I mean, look at Marianne. <laughs> you know, she's yeah. she's serving in a church and and she's still involved and and that ability to serve and have a place and be welcomed and and have those gifts recognized as important and valuable within the community um, makes a huge difference. Absolutely, and I think it's a tough. Um, while while y'all were talking, I was thinking about the the dichotomy that we live in, where we want to pour into the young people like Marianne that are serving. Uh, Marianne is on staff at a church and is pouring into students. Um, she needs a place to come and refuel and get charged up with people her own age and her own uh, level, socially, spiritually, whatever. Um, but then we also need to make a place for those who have been burned by the church, have never attended church, don't speak our churchy language, um, all of, you know, are broken in other capacities and, and, and whatever. Um, and I think on paper that's really hard to do, um, to meet the need, those two kind of drastically different needs. But in practice, I've not found it to be um, all that challenging. Um, does anybody have experience in that kind of meeting those needs at the same time, or with the same type of ministry or something, something like that? Am I making sense? I mean, I think service projects, um, especially projects that are already happening in the community mm -hmm. that you join with other young people, um, are a good place to do that. Um, one of our more successful things that we ever did that I'd like to get back to doing was sort of a, we did this happy hour conversation at a bar nearby that um, we took on like really hard topics mm -hmm. and sort of tried to think through those theologically but also invite people to pretty much question the church mm -hmm. and um, so we had one on immigration, one on the death penalty, um, things that were especially relevant to, to maybe what was going on at the time. We had a lot of people bring their friends to those. Um, either people that just really wanted to go to happy hour and get free pizza, um, or people that really was were interested in what do pastors and churches have to say on this. That's awesome. And that's meeting people where they are, too. I like that. Any other real world examples that y'all have? Marianne or Kristen? I guess we lost Josh. Sad. He sent me a text. He was getting a script error. Oh. He so. should be able to fix that, I feel like. I know. That's what I said. So he's working on it. Good. It's like no guru is over there working on it. <laughs> you may use it as an excuse to buy a new part for the computer, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Abby hit it on the head. I think having um, that safe place, that judgment-free place to chat mm -hmm. is, is a big deal um, for both groups of students. The, the ones who, um, you use the words churchy language, the ones who are familiar with our churchy language, and the ones who aren't, um, the ones who are in a place of discernment and the ones who are in a place of doubt, right? Um, being able to come to a location, come to a place, and, and say, this is this is how I feel about it, and this is where I see the answers in Scripture, and this is how I see that working into our lives, and this is how I see um, that uh, bleeding into my faith and who I am. Um, that place where it can just be completely judgment-free is so vital and important. Um, I feel like that's where we lose students a lot of times. Mm -hmm. We don't give them the freedom to disagree. Um, and to really hash things out and and allow them that um, free zone to do that in. 
And I think that's something that we all know. Um, but teaching others that is challenging. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to let people come in question. Um, and I think that that's a new swing in our um, I don't know, programming, church, evangelism, um, that 50 years ago that wasn't the case. And so to tell someone who's been in ministry for 20 years, this is how you're going to reach new people, um, is controversial. I don't find it controversial. It just makes sense in me. But to, t to talk um, to others about that, be that others, pastors who are trying to start young adult programs or um, uh, members of the congregation that are essentially supporting a young adult program that they don't really understand um, of the premise of which it exists, uh, which is which is a challenge. Um, but I think mission projects and things like that uh, are appealing to those who grew up in the church, those who didn't grow up in the church, and it also gives us an opportunity to build relationships. Uh, you know, young people are looking for our generations are looking for um, authenticity, for an opportunity to be real and be who they are um, by working alongside someone, whether that's um, serving soup at a soup kitchen or uh, making uh, mats for the homeless or um, building a, a, a wheelchair ramp. You're, you're, it's dual purpose, you know, that's serving. Um, but it's also building relationships with the people that you're right next to. Um, what other, I really want to get to some of the stuff that y'all want to talk about. What other questions do you have that we can all answer collectively or uh, successes have you had that is just like you have to share this awesome story? Remember that this will be watched by, I don't know, Half a dozen, maybe other people. <laughs> Tens of other student yeah. directors. <laughs> yeah. Tens. So you can say something that, I mean, obviously we all already know everything, but remember that there's going to be people watching that maybe d doesn't know it. So there's, there's a great book out, um, and it's an older book, like probably 15 or 20 years old now. Um, but it's called uh, Why it's Nobody Learns. Older than Marianne. Do what? It's older than Marianne. It is older than Marianne. She was like two when it was written. Um, <laughs> um, no, it's called Why Nobody Learns Anything at Church mm. and How to Fix It. And um, it's really centered around around reforming Sunday school. But it hits on this great point um, that you you kind of hit on a few seconds ago, and it is that. Um, that communication gap, that stop gap between um, the older minister and the younger minister of, of understanding the difference in these generations, right? Like, if there's been a, a dramatic shift, and there continues to be a dramatic shift um, in the way we, I hate to say do church, but yeah, do church, um, because it's not about educating you about uh, what you have to know to be a good Methodist, a good Baptist, a good Christian. It's about having a real, authentic, experienced faith. Mm -hmm. So the days of Sunday school, per se, the days of rote memorization, those days are passing. And so we've got to provide these students that place to experience their faith, not just learn and be educated in this real passive kind of way, but to have this multi-sensory, four-dimensional thing going on within the walls of our churches. Sorry, awesome. I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> no, that's, no, people are listening. They don't know anything. So no, just, I just looked up the book, and I'm going to post the link um, right now that I found on Amazon. Although y'all are smart and probably know how to look up things on Amazon, too. But <laughs> I just did it, so... Bam. There you go. <laughs> what else do we need to address? Great book. Sorry, my microphone was muted. Um, one thing that I really struggle with 
as a pastor is being okay when things don't meet my expectations mm -hmm. or remembering other triumphs. Like there are times when I get very frustrated because people are all out of town and so this one event that we do every month isn't as big or um, you know people can't seem to put energy into the things I want them to put energy into it and it's not because they're bad people it's just because they're traveling or um, their band is playing the night before or their band is playing that day or they have to work um, because their job doesn't let them take Sundays off um, or they've you know been working hard the past three weeks and want to just go hiking that Sunday um, mm -hmm. and I think I tend to get so frustrated sometimes with how transient young people are and I don't take enough joy in the things that are going really well and the things that um, maybe I can't replicate every month but I can remember the good ones and go okay um, let's take it from here let's analyze from here but I think I you know that's more of a soul issue but I think that's probably the harder thing to me about working with young people is it's a long slow process and um, it takes a while to grow and so we don't look like the other what other programs in the church seem to be more mm -hmm. big or exciting or crazy and it's like well you don't look like that but there's really good stuff happening I wish there was a way to chart that but it's a little harder to measure those vital signs. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but I think it's so important. And, and one thing I try to encourage, both in, in youth and young adult ministry, really, is um, you've got to count um, the relationships, the meaningful conversations that you have, mm -hmm. not just how many people attended such and such event. Um, so you can't count. I had... 15 kids at youth group, or you can, but that's not the whole picture. I had 15 kids at youth group, but I went to the football game and I had meaningful conversations with 10 students, most of their parents, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Like, you've got to be able to count that. And, um, and, and our bishop talks about this a lot, about the narrative, uh, telling the story. Um, and that's really important. You may only have three people in an event, um, but they have an incredibly meaningful experience and they're able to do something they've never done before and they've been able to experience God in ways that they've never experienced before. Is that not just as good as having 15 of people at an event? Like, we can't even compare those two, um, which is really hard when we're living in like a black and white world where we have to have like these concrete numbers, especially when we're turning them into vital congregations and what have you. Um, but it is, a, it is difficult to like retrain our brains to think about things like that. The practical side, um, Abby, what I heard is uh, consistency. It's really hard to maintain consistency when you have a down month. Well, maybe we need to change it all up. The next month we're going to do it totally different. Maybe it was just a down month. Maybe you know, but I'm I'm I do this all the time. Like if we have a an, a down month at a certain event, the next month I want to change everything to make it better, to make it go back up. Well, changing it isn't always the best thing to do. Uh, consistency I found is is better, and that's not to say we don't need to change things up and make them different sometimes, but. Um, consistency and just doing things. Okay, we're going to do this once a month or once a week for six months and just see what happens and then we'll reevaluate and if we need to change things then we'll change things but um, you know knowing this was just a down week because so and so was busy and this was happening and this person had worked and is is taking time off or you know um, understanding those things and being able to still have meaningful relationships with them even if they were out that one two-hour block of time. Um, what else you got? Anything exciting we can discover? Well, 
I just, I'll just quit talking after this, but you made me think of, I mean, what I'm most excited about this week, even though it has been one of those down weeks, is, um, you know, on Martin Luther King weekend, I volunteered somewhere um, so I could meet young people that were interested in service um, but not connected to church. And I did meet someone there who's not a Christian, um, but so interested in service that she wants to be on our mailing list and is going to come with me to, um, this is going to sound really weird, but I visit a strip club once a month to pray with women there and bring them cookies. And um, she wants to come with me to that, and she's making cookies. And so those are the things where I'm like, I can't really put that in a vital congregation's report. But to me, her coming to volunteer with a church on Friday is huge. Mm -hmm. And she, I think she'll be my only volunteer with me. But that's awesome. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> that is fantastic. And that just sounds like such an awesome ministry and completely outside the box. I feel like you and Marianne need to get together because y'all are close together. Twenty minutes away. Call me. We'll I know <laughs> Rosalie Bonner was at Southwestern, and she would come to our church on Sundays. So oh, yeah. feel free to stop by anytime. Cool. <laughs> I'll get y'all connected. That's awesome, and that is, you're right. That's hard to quantify, but um, incredibly meaningful. Like you can't put a value on that kind of experience. Um, and that's awesome. That's awesome. What else y'all got? Anything exciting to share? Marianne, we, I don't think we really touched on your uh, home church, school church. Yeah. It's something I was thinking about just because I was just home away from my school church. And it was yeah. an interesting experience that I hadn't had a lot before. Because usually when I go home, I don't go home for Sundays because I'm working. And um, I, uh, sorry, and um, it's like there are people who graduated with me and go to UTA, and they still kind of go to church there, but it's not really the same because the young adult program is different, and then it's like when we all come home, then it's like, oh, well, you guys can just go hang out with the youth because those are your friends, and it's like, but if I'm home for a whole month, then I'm not here just to visit people. Like, I'm living here, and I can't just take a month to just hang out, because those are your friends. Like, I need something better than that. But um, it's not like the regular young adult ministry, anything is happening, because all the people that are there during the semester are gone, because they all went back to their homes. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, if everybody goes back to their homes and has kind of a similar problem, then that's a problem big enough to where we should be able to do something. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, huh. Yeah. Because I've noticed that at uh, St. Philip's, too, is that uh, some of the older siblings are like, well, we all go to church together, and then everybody goes to Sunday school, so I'll just go to the youth Sunday school, or I'll just mm -hmm. hang out until my parents are ready to drive back home. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like there should be something. One thing that our church has done, mostly kind of out of default, is um, have the young adu adult group kind of adopt those college students, both dur those that are there during the school year and then leave, and those over Christmas break and in the summer. So there's continuity in that we're always meeting. We meet all year, and there's you know a handful of late 20s, early 30s folks um, and so those college kids can just come and go, and uh, we're unique because we don't really follow any set curriculum or anything like that. So you can come once and never come again, and hopefully you feel like you got nurtured um, in some capacity. But maybe that's something churches need to look at of having, um, and it wouldn't necessarily need to be a younger adult class or a younger adult small group or something, but maybe... Um, I, my brain just like went in seven different directions. 
Yeah. But yeah. what if one Sunday school class, an older adult Sunday school class or something, adopted the college students while they were home for Christmas, and y'all all just come together, and the older adults do something fun for the college students, and they study a book for four weeks over Christmas or over the summer or something, or maybe there's a new Sunday school class that's created that anybody can just come to, and it'll be an intergenerational thing over um, yeah. Christmas or the summer where it's college students that have come home. I'm thinking particularly in the smaller churches where it's not like 30 people, 30 kids coming home, but 10 um, or 5 or 3 where it would be a more intergenerational thing, but that you wouldn't miss anything by being gone all year. You just come, do that study together, get fed, learn something, build relationships, and then you go back to school. And that might be something that would be helpful at any time for anyone, because there are a lot of people that are of many ages but are still transient, I guess you could call mm -hmm. it. Like, I don't know, there are people that have gone to Epworth for a long time, but now they don't live very close, so they don't make it there every week, and mm -hmm. people don't know them as well, and so it might be kind of cool to have a, a little orphan Sunday school class. Yeah. Actually, my sister was in a Sunday school class, and that was what it was called. That's what they called themselves. Like, they didn't fit anywhere else, so they started a Sunday school class. And it was awesome. It was, um, she was like 22, 23, and there were, the pastor's husband was in that class because he didn't really fit anywhere else, and it was awesome. Well, you're welcome. I just solved all the problems. We just need an orphan small group. Done. Anything else that I can solve for y'all? Any other questions, comments, concerns? Awesome. I'm going to take the silence to mean that... <laughs> I'm going to take the crickets to mean that uh, we've solved all the problems and we can go about our afternoon. Um, I would love to close our time in prayer. Do you all have any, anything we can be praying for specifically? You know what? Hang on. Let me end broadcast. <laughs>